also the numbers for the um, for our, our program you can see um, now now when you look at these numbers you have to remember um, what that number in the first slide that you saw said right 16 percent a couple of numbers from that first slide 16% um, uh, of Baylor's total student population of 15,000 uh, is Latino. Um, and let's say, let's say conservatively speaking, right, half of those um, students are heritage speakers. What is um, half of 15% of, somebody help me with the math because I'm really bad at math, <laughs> half of 15% of 15,000. It's 800, 800 students, okay? So, so we may have eight, who knows? We probably have more. This is what we're finding out. Well, there might be 800 students walking around campus with varying levels of proficiency in Spanish um, who either, one, might not ever take a Spanish class. Um, maybe they're bringing an AP credit. They had an awesome teacher like Delia Montesinos in high school. Um, or maybe they're, um, you know, maybe they uh, are, are purposely uh, gravitating towards programs that don't have language requirements, et cetera. So there's lots of, lots of things going on there. Um, but certainly, it should be more than six, right? Or eight, or seven, or 11. So you can see our enrollments, you know, our history of enrollments in this class, once it got started, actually 2013, fall 2013, this first, this asterisk here, uh, means that um, that we actually tried to run more than one section of the class. So um, they the uh, the person uh, who put the the course into place um, before he retired and before Karen came to Baylor, um, they were pretty enthusiastic about this, knowing our our uh, heritage speaker potential at Baylor, and they put three sections of heritage speaker Spanish on the schedule. Zero enrollment, they had to, or they had maybe have one or two students, they had to cancel all three sections. So then scale back, spring of 2014, you know, one section, and they had 10 students, so we like to see a minimum of 10 students, right, and so it barely made. And then the next semester, they didn't even offer it in the fall. <laughs> Of, uh, of 2014. That was my first semester um, at Baylor and then I said well we should be offering this every semester. Obviously it's got to it's going to pick up at some point right? So we had eight students in spring of 2015. I thought oh that's great. We've got eight, eight students. You know we're going to get the word out in the fall. We're going to offer two 2304 classes, heritage speaker classes and we'll see you know hey we'll get 16. I'm thinking you know geometrically right? Uh, expansion, you know, we'll be up to 800 before you before you know it, right? And uh, um, and and then that semester we had six. <laughs> um, we didn't offer it that following spring because that faculty member that retired mid-year, um, and then Karen came on. Um, we had a break in the fall, and then we offered it again. We we're restarting it, and you can see sort of a pattern. It's obvious we have you know fewer students in the spring than we do in the fall, so something's going on there. Um, uh, among other things, other challenges you may have um, that weren't mentioned, uh, advising. Um, what, are, what, are student, what are the students' advisors telling them about their language requirements? Um, it could be a delicate thing identifying, you know, for an advisor who doesn't speak Spanish, um, identifying a heritage speaker. Um, but that's where we also probably need to depend um, on student services. In my previous institution, we had a great relationship with a Multicultural Student Association, for example, and uh, the advisors, uh, uh, staff over there, um, who encouraged students to develop their linguistic skills um, in languages that they were already strong in. So, so that helped our language programs out. Um, this is something that it's a relationship we have to cultivate anew you know, and starting this new program.